Hello, this is Mrs. O'Reilly and Mr. Harfinus, and we're here to do a little introduction to the periodic table with you. This matches up with chapter five in your book, um, and it's just the beginning of the chapter. You're gonna have to bear with us as we um, navigate this distance learning. This is all new to us, and Mr. Harfinus and I can't even see each other right now, so we are we're gonna have to bear with us if there's some awkward pauses. And there probably will be. <laughs> Uh, so, as to get, to get started, the first known element, um, this all starts back in the 1700s. There was about 30 elements that were known. They were pretty much the normal, everyday run-of-the-mill elements like oxygen and chlorine and uh, gold, silver, copper. At any rate, um, at the very beginning, um, when people tried to group them, they, they tried to group them or sort them based on their properties. And they, they usually did so in groups of three, like you kind of see here, um, that this was a group of three because chlorine, bromine, and iodine reacted very similarly. Um, and uh, I'm gonna let Miss O'Reilly go on. <laughs> and so what ended up becoming from that is uh, Mendeleev, uh, a Russian scientist, he created a periodic table and he took those groups of elements and he realized that those those properties tended to repeat themselves if he put all the elements in order by the mass, which was one of the known factors, one of the known things about the elements that they had at the time. Um, what was really special and really important about Mendeleev's periodic table is that there were gaps. And those gaps were where he predicted that an element that hadn't been discovered yet would fit. And one example of that is germanium. And he was able to leave a gap where germanium now is and later on, uh, another scientist discovered it and it fit in really nicely. Okay, so what you're looking at here is the modern periodic table. And one of the big differences between Mendeleev's table and this one is that instead of increasing by atomic mass, this increases by atomic number. A special note to that because a lot of students um, forget that. Um, as you look through the periodic table, you will notice a couple of things about it. One, that there are seven rows, which are horizontal, and on that, to the left of each row, you will see the number. And the way that the elements are grouped are based on um, their families or valence electrons, which we're going to talk about in the next couple of slides. In each box on the periodic table, there's some consistent information, no matter which periodic table you're looking at. And you're always gonna see the atomic number, which corresponds to the number of protons. You're gonna see the symbol, which is universal, no matter which language the periodic table is written for. Uh, the name, sodium in this case, and the average atomic mass, which you remember from earlier in the year in our Benium lab, that this is the weighted average of the naturally occurring isotopes. Some periodic tables will have some extra information, but these four main pieces here will always be there. Okay, so um, the main purpose of this slide is to introduce you to, again to the modern periodic table and kind of review where different elements fall. Um, as you can see, what we already talked about, if you look to the left of each row, you see the numbers one through seven, indicating what row they're in, what period, sorry, what period they are in. Um, remember that as you start each row, the, the properties react similarly, so they repeat themselves in a, what they call periodic fashion. Okay, so um, the groups or families are also known as vertical columns, and as you look across, there happen to be 18 of them. Um, and the way that they're grouped, they're grouped by similarities, how they react, similarities, properties, and importantly similarities in the number of valence electrons. So as we start at group one, you're gonna notice that um, they all are going to have one valence electron. They are called the alkali metals. Um, if you notice the one element in particular is in green, hydrogen. Hydrogen is a member of this family due to the fact that it has one valence electron, but it is not a metal, it is clearly a non-metal. Um, as you move to group two in blue, you're gonna notice that they all have two valence electrons and they are the alkaline earth metals. Next, you have these groups three through 12 and they're this light orange color, this tan color. And these are the transition metals. In the, this, um, this group here, you're gonna have the most common metals like gold, silver, titanium, chromium, and iron, um, and nickel and copper. 
And um, so you're gonna see a lot of common elements here. They transition really from the most metallic properties on the left all the way to less metallic and more non-metallic properties to the right. Um, we also have inner transition metals, these two rows along the bottom here. They fit in where these gaps are here where it says 57 to 71 is the lanthanide series. And where it says 89 to 103 is where the actinide series um, fits in. These two together are called the inner transition elements or the inner transition metals. Um, they are kind of pulled apart just for aesthetically pleasing reasons. It, it fits a little bit better and it looks a little nicer. But if you remember from a couple slides back, they do in fact fit here and really seem to stretch the periodic table out. As we move on to the right side of the table, you're going to notice that groups 13 through 16 are a little bit, they're very multicolored. Um, as Ms. O'Reilly was talking about, we have begun to transition from metals into uh, metalloids into non-metals here. So if you look at group 13, 13 starts off with a metalloid, and as you go down, the rest of them are metals. And then group 14, you start with a non-metal being carbon, then you hit metalloids being silicon germanium, and then end with tin and lead. Um, they don't really have fancy names. They do have the same number of valence electrons. The way that you do valence electrons for um, the groups on the right is you take away the one um, in front of each of the groups. So group 13, you take away the one, it's three valence electrons. Group 14, you take away the one, there's four valence electrons and so forth. Um, like I said, there's no fancy names. Um, the families are named after the lead element. So group 13 with three valence electrons is the boron family. Group 14 um, with four valence electrons is the carbon family. Group 15 with five valence electrons is the nitrogen family. And as you probably could guess by now, group 16 would have six valence electrons. It's named the oxygen family, sometimes the chalogens. Um, group 17 is all non-metals, and it's very important that you note that they have seven valence electrons, and they have a special name. They are the halogens. Um, and then finally, the last group to the right, group 18, is the noble gas group. They're also called inert gases. Um, because they are stable um, and they react very little. Um, they all have eight valence electrons except for helium at the top, which has two. The first row is a little bit odd with hydrogen and helium. Helium still has all the characteristics of an inert gas. It just happens to have two valence electrons instead of eight. And I think we're gonna move to the next slide. <laughs> so the periodic law is this idea that as we lay these elements out into these rows, um, those properties that we've been talking about repeat in a periodic fashion. And in order for this to work, the elements are arranged in order of increasing atomic number, and you're going to see this repetition. So you're going to see this rainbow keep repeating. So if I line them up end to end, you see this just rainbow changing, almost like a piece of yarn. And when you um, take those rows and you put them one beneath the next, you can see that all the yellows lined up and all the greens lined up and all the blues and the reds and the oranges and the purples, they all lined up with their similar colors. So if you look at an individual row as you move from left to right, the properties are changing. And as you look um, from one row to the next or one period to the next, you see that same set of properties repeating and it forms this pattern where in a, in a column or in a group, we, we can call them families, um, in each family, they have similar properties. And one of those, like Mr. Harfin has mentioned, is the number of valence electrons. And that's just the most important um, part of being able to use the periodic table and predict different properties of elements that are there. Okay, so as we move through the next couple of slides, it's all gonna be review. If you remember from the early part of the year, we did talk about the different types of elements. There are three main types of elements. There are metals, metalloids, and non-metals. Um, yes, so um, the metals are usually found in the left staircase, um, and those encompass about 80% of all the elements. The non-metals are to the right staircase. Um, just a reminder, do you see how high is included as a non-metal, even though it's all the way to the left? And then finally, in green, you're going to notice that on the staircase, you're going to have metalloids, which are going to take properties of both metals and non-metals. 
And with those properties, again, just to review, um, metals are good conductors of heat and electric current. Um, they have high luster, they're ductile, malleable. Non-metals, you're gonna see the opposite, basically. They're poor conductors of heat and electric current. They are mostly gases at room temperature, although there are examples of solids like sulfur and phosphorus and bromine, which is a liquid. Um, and metalloids are going to show some of both, some properties of each. So they are gonna be the hybrid model. Um, the metalloids are gonna have some properties that are metallic and some properties that are non-metallic. And what's neat about that and what allows us to have so many different applications for the metalloids is that we can actually control or manipulate what the, the properties, the behavior of those metalloids are by changing the conditions. But just like in all the other properties, as you move across the period, the properties are changing. And for the metallic properties, they are the elements to the left of the periodic table are going to have the most metallic properties. And as you move across, they're going to become less metallic and actually more non metallic. So again, those properties repeat themselves and elements in the, sim in the same group or column will share similar properties. Nice. So that's all we have for you today. Um, we hope that you were able to follow along and we thank you for your patience as we figure this distance learning thing out. Um, and, and, and we'll see you next time. <laughs> yeah, email us or write on Google Classroom if you have any questions. We'll see you next time. Bye.